Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. Are right, we doing oh. this? Yeah, let's do an episode of Modern Dadhood, the podcast. <laughs> oh, now it can start. Hey, Mark. Adam. Sorry, it wasn't ex- that wasn't enthusiastic enough. Hey, Mark. Adam. Good to see you, my friend. Was that? That wasn't that was- <laughs> believable enough. One more time. All right. Hey, Mark. Adam. <laughs> we suck at this. <laughs> I know it's so terrible. This is Modern Dadhood. It's an ongoing conversation about the joys, challenges, and general insanity of being a dad in this moment. And my name is Adam J. Flaherty. I'm a father of two daughters who are six and a half and three and a half. And you, sir? Well, I, I certainly don't know what the J stands for, but I'd, I'd like a chance to guess. Sure. And then I'll tell you my middle initial. If you don't already know, you can you can guess and it'll be a fun thing. My name is Mark a check it mark andrew oh shit we've how could i've forgotten <laughs> well, we didn't talk about yours i don't think my name is mark a check it and i am a dad to twin boy toddlers and the whole world knows my middle name is andrew all right you got you've got two guesses jay you know what i'm gonna do here i'm gonna demonstrate some critical thinking adam as a little nod to our episode here i know that your last name's flarity Irish. Yes. You see? You see what I've done there? But Adam, Adam's very, I don't know. Man of the earth. Biblical. So your middle name begins with J. Jacob. Jacob? Jacob. No. Jakey. No, it's a very common J name. James. The most common J name. Oh. John Bobbitt. That's who I was named after. We did it, man. This has been another episode of Modern Pornhood. <laughs> no, we did it. You know what I'm talking about? We did it. We booked an astronaut on the podcast. It's like a, a dream of yours that began many, many moons ago. I did, in fact, say in one of our earliest episodes, if you remember that when I was a kid, I, I briefly had this idea that being an astronaut would be kind of a magical career, Hmm. which I think is probably true of a lot of kids. Sure. I think for me, even as a kid, like I knew that I wasn't necessarily cut out for it, but I've always admired people who have the determination and the drive and the natural smarts, right? To, to work towards opportunities and careers like this. Yeah. It certainly takes like a special kind of human being, a special kind of brain, I think, to to be able to achieve that level, to become something like an astronaut. Um, and so shortly, we'll listen to our interview with former astronaut Winston E. Scott. What do you think the E stands for? Einstein, probably, because he's got <laughs> such a smart brain. That's a good guess. I'll give you a hint because I'm looking at it on my computer screen right you now. No. Here's your hint. And it's an appropriate one. Hmm. E.T. His middle name's extraterrestrial. No. Oh, it's it's Elliot. Yes. But I'm pretty sure you have to say it like this. Oh, oh. Elliot. Elliot. (laughs) Okay, now write into hey at moderndadhood.com and let us know who who was the better. Who's fired. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't know about you, Mark, but I've been wanting to do a STEM centric episode for a long time now. And I'm hoping that everybody who's listening knows what this acronym STEM stands for. But in case you don't, Mark, can you please tell us? Strong, temperamental. No. Menopause. Science. Mm -hmm. Technology. Yep. Entertainment. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Engineering. Mm Mm-hmm. And mathematics. Actually, I think there's a, there's, I, I actually just for S's and G's, I, I, I looked it up because there's STEM and then there's also STEAM because sometimes people add arts and yeah, the I'm, arts. I'm, I'm the type of individual who, who likes to insert arts uh, in there. And here's what Wikipedia says. And I wonder if this was actually the way maybe you're supposed to read the acronym, but anyway, it's a STEM fields are defined science and technology interpreted through 
engineering, and the liberal arts, and based in mathematics. Hmm. Interesting. I wish I had that little bit of knowledge before speaking with an astronaut. Should have done some research. I'm a little nervous to say this because I feel like I'm going to sound like an old fart, mm. but um, you will. But we live in a, in a world where a lot of the jobs or careers that are currently available today are going to become obsolete when our kids get old enough to be moving into the the workforce, because I don't think of it in terms of like robots taking over for humans, but certainly like AI will be taking on more and more of those roles. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, that is one of the reasons why getting a well-rounded education that, that includes a strong STEM component is so important for our kids. Yeah. I, the, the thing is, is that there are, jobs that don't yet exist. That's actually interesting. There are a lot of roles that will no longer be filled by humans in the mm -hmm. future, but there are also a whole bunch of jobs that don't currently exist that will require humans. Right. Like somebody has to feed the robots, you know? <laughs> exactly. But I just think even in general, any human can benefit from the type of education that you, you get pursuing I mean, you don't even have to go so far as to pursue a career in a, in the STEM field. But in preparation for this interview with Winston and ever since, I've been, you know, really kind of contemplating what it really takes, like the brain power that it takes to just absorb information now. You know, I mean, you and I both remember life before the Internet, you know, talk about sounding like an old fart. But like the information that you got from the world came at you at a way different pace, a way different mm -hmm. pace mm -hmm. and from fewer places. Right. And the places that they came from were generally considered uh, trustworthy. Yeah. You know? What was it? The news? Yeah. I mean, Newspapers, magazines. Every the radio. city had their big local newspaper. There was a few national newspapers, a few national news outlets, but there was not like the 24 hour news cycle or God knows how many websites that put themselves out there as a news outlet. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, if you add social media into the mix, it just gets absolutely crazy. And I think that's the thing is that you hear a lot of times people in, in like interviews on TV or whatever, you're watching some political something or other. And it's like, you know, someone's trying to gotcha interview someone and they're like, where'd you hear that? And it's like from the, I saw it on Facebook. It's like, you, like you have no idea where this information is coming from. And my point is that there's so much of it that just sifting through it is difficult enough, but pulling out factual bits and meaningful information, reliable information, identifying something like reliable sources takes a certain amount of critical thinking. We need to be able to parse out something that just doesn't smell right. You know, it just doesn't feel right. We need to be able to have the ability to do that. I agree with you. What we're talking about here is critical thinking, which I would argue is a very important component to a STEM education. We talk about all this and more in our conversation with Winston Scott. So I think that we should play it back. What do you think, Mark? Yes, I'm very very excited for everyone to hear this. Let's go ahead and listen to our conversation with Winston Scott. I'd like to welcome Captain Winston Scott to the conversation. This is a man who has quite a list of impressive achievements, among other things. He was a Navy captain in the 1970s, an astronaut in the 90s, and I didn't mistakenly say astronaut. <laughs> he holds a master of science degree in aeronautical engineering. He's been an educator, an author. He is a seasoned trumpet player and an inspiration to so, so many people, both young and old. Um, and as it happens, he, he's also a dad to two grown children. So uh, Winston Scott, it's very exciting to get a chance to talk with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me on your program. This should be exciting, and I'm looking forward to getting into the conversation. 
us too, us too. And I, I, I know that we could go off in probably a hundred different tangents about some of the stories that you have. So well, I'll do my best to contain my excitement as we, as we go through <laughs> these questions. But we'd love to begin with you just telling us a little bit about your family and, and your kids. Okay, well, my family consists of myself, my wife, two adult children. Daughter is married, and we have our first grandchild, two years old. Son is not married yet, but we're, we're hoping for that here at some point here in the future. <laughs> uh, my wife and I live in Melbourne, Florida. We're both Florida natives. And uh, my career took us all over the place, of course. You know, being, being native, we moved all over the place. But now we live in Melbourne, Florida. And uh, our son is an active duty naval officer, naval aviator. And he is a captain now, which tells you how old I am. His son's a captain. Oh, wow. And he is the commanding officer of one of the fighter squadrons out at Naval Air Station, uh, Lamar, California. Our daughter is a journalist. Well, she combines journalism and public health. She has a master's degree in journalism, worked for the Associated Press in Manhattan for a number of years, went back to school, got a master's in public health, and now works for the state of New Jersey the public health department in the state of New Jersey. So that's uh, my family at this day in, in, in time. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing them during the holidays, which are rapidly approaching. Well, I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that your children have gone on to do very uh, impressive things. I wonder if you can walk us through sort of an abridged version of your timeline, including you know some of your career milestones, but also when your kids came into the picture in relation to the impressive things that you were doing with your career? Well, my wife and I met each other in college during our undergraduate year. So we've been together for a long time. We met at Florida State University here, here in Tallahassee. And uh, I graduated just a couple of semesters before she did, started flight training. She graduated. We got married. And I continued in the flight training. I finished my flight training in 1974. I was designated a naval aviator. And our first assignment was in San Diego, California. So we were a young couple, brand new uh, Navy officer and, and wife moving out to San Diego, California. We knew no one out there, but we knew an, an adventure was ahead of us. And our son was born in March of 76. And I was working up for my first deployment then. So uh, he was just a few months old when I made my first deployment wow. to Western Pacific. Uh, we, we finished that tour of duty and in 78, I was accepted to attend Naval Post Graduate School in Monterey, California. My wife was pregnant with our daughter. Yeah, so we had a, a baby son and, and a baby daughter on the way when we arrived in Monterey. So during my uh, postgraduate work, our daughter was born in 1980. I finished my graduate work and was assigned to Oceana, Virginia for a Naval Air Station Oceana. In 85, I got a new assignment moving down to Naval Air Station, Jacksonville, Florida. And here's where I made the transition from being an operational pilot to aerospace engineering mm. officer. Well, at this point in my career, I switched from, from doing operational things to getting to the research, development, testing, evaluation side of flying. In 92, I was selected by NASA for astronaut training. The family picked up again and moved to Houston. Mm. And of course, we stayed in Houston long enough for the two of them to graduate. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a lot to keep track of. But uh, it's been uh, just a, a delightful life career wise, but also having a family. You know, my wife and I have been married for 47 years. That's amazing. Life is good. So you were always interested in STEM and your kids saw that firsthand with the work you were doing in the Navy. Tell us about how your family reacted when you learned you were selected for astronaut training by NASA. When I was selected, of course, it was a big deal. You know, the newspapers and, and interviews and all that stuff. It was very exciting for everybody, even relatives, distant relatives. And in fact, you, you discover you have relatives and friends that you never knew you had because <laughs> it really is a life changing event for so many people. I can remember we had a, a kind of a little family meeting. I remember telling our kids that I was selected for astronaut training and that the family was going to have to pick up and move to, uh, <laughs> to Houston. Mm -hmm. My daughter was really funny. She asked the question, are we going to be rich and get a zoo like Michael Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> get a zoo. I, uh, I had That's to bring amazing. the zoos to her. I said, That's dad's great. going to do some interesting things, but we probably will not be rich and we probably won't get a zoo <laughs> like Michael Jackson. <laughs> our That's son, great. Son was a little bit older and he said, you know, 
I really don't want to move. He said, I like it here. I've got my friends here. But one thing I've learned over the years is that every time we move, it gets better. That's mm. quite often fifth grader. So the, the stage was set and we finally, uh, we moved to Houston. Kids, of course, are used to moving around and starting over again, making new friends. They both hit the ground running. I was assigned to my first space flight in uh, 1996. We flew nine days in orbit aboard the space shuttle Endeavour. Two years later, I spent 16 days in orbit aboard the space shuttle Columbia. On both those flights, I had two primary jobs. I was a flight engineer, mission specialist to MS2 as a flight engineer, the flight that crew, the people that actually operated the vehicle. But my other specialty was spacewalking, EVA, as you said. I conducted three EVAs. And now EVA is extravehicular the activity. That's right. Activity. Yes, but right. fascinating for spacewalking. Put the sewer and go outside. For those who don't know, you hear the term spacewalking. It puts an image of, in your head of somebody walking on the moon or walking on a planet. But this is you're, we're, we're talking about exiting the spacecraft and still right. being attached to the spacecraft. Yeah, yeah, exiting the spacecraft and working outside in the vacuum of space. And uh, the suit is self-contained. You do have a safety tether. You try to remain tethered all the time to the spaceship. But you're actually, you're not walking in our case because we're, we're in orbit. So we're floating. So like we call it space water where we're floating. And all of your movement typically is hand over hand. You move yourself around from place to place and you accomplish all kinds of tasks when you're outside of your vehicle with that space suit on. During those two flights, we were focused primarily on preparations to build the International Space Station. So I tested a lot of tools, equipment, techniques, and so on that like astronauts later used to build the International Space Station. I've heard several astronauts before describe how their perspective on what it means to be a human being once they've gone up into space and they they get a chance to look down at the Earth from a vantage point that so few human beings have have had the opportunity to do. Would you say you had a, a similar experience in terms of you, uh, your perspective of yes. what it means to be a human? Yes, I don't think you can fly in space or have an experience like that and not have it affect you in one way or another. And I think universally, astronauts when, who s- see the Earth from space realize how small it is. It, it's finite. You know, we never see beyond the Earth when we're on Earth or, or even in an airplane. But when you're in space, you see the Earth, you see the boundary, but then you can see all beyond it, other stuff. So you realize just how small, finite, and fragile the Earth is. It is absolutely incredible. If I were an alien in my spaceship approaching Earth, it looks so inviting and peaceful. I would say definitely, yeah, you, hey, let's pull over and go land there. Yeah. <laughs> Check out the Earth. You know? And then and then a bunch of people who have seen one too many science fiction movies show up. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they show up and, and they, they chase me away, probably. But that's actually a fantastic segue, because I'm so curious to know, like, what kinds of conversations are you having with your family in the hours before liftoff? We didn't really have there was no opportunity to really sit down and talk to them about the flight itself, at least I did. And I think my, my wife talked with our daughter about it and tried to let her know that what I was about to do is something that is important to the whole world, but something that I wanted to do, something that dad mm. chose to do. And we're proud of him. It's a great accomplishment. We should not worry about it. Mm. Son was excited. You know, he wanted to know if there's some way he could go. Yeah. <laughs> <Or> <laughs> you could pack him into a suitcase. Yeah. Is there room uh, for one more back there in the back? That's right. <laughs> But where I'm going with this is that one of the things we try to teach or try to instill in our children as they were growing up is to not be afraid. We didn't want them to grow up with a spirit of fear. We wanted them to grow up with a spirit of adventure and challenge and gravitating toward things that were, were different and exciting. I think too often parents instill fear in their children and maybe not deliberately, but, but they do it. You know, we're, we're in the military. We're getting ready for a set of orders. And somebody says, oh, I don't really want to go. Oh, right, right, right. oh we don't know anybody out there. Mm-hmm. All you're doing is reinforcing fear. But from day one, we always reinforce, hey, this is a great adventure. We're getting ready to move to San Diego. We're going to move to Monterey. We're going to move. We're going to meet new people. We're going to meet new friends. And, and remember Richie and Joy? Jake, guess what? They live in they live in Jacksonville also. When we get there, you'll get to see Richie and Joy. So we try to instill in them a sense of 
of adventure, a sense of boldness, and not a sense of fear. And of course, our son, Naval Academy, he fighter pilot, he's flown combat missions over Iraq and Afghanistan. Daughter, you know, very bold in her own right. She studied abroad. She applied for and got accepted to a study abroad program. So she spent a semester living with a family in France, learning French and speaking French. She spent a summer working in Egypt and she was exploring the pyramids, seeing a picture of her of riding a camel. And so <laughs> the kids are, <laughs> are adventurous and they're yeah. bold and we like to think they, they live life to the fullest. That's amazing. And clearly it has worked to your children's advantage because they have lived a life that has sort of followed in your footsteps or been inspired by your work in many ways. And I think that it almost goes against the instincts of many parents because you have a baby and it's suddenly your job to keep that separate entity safe and protected. Yes, you do want to protect your children. You know, when you, you can't neglect them. You can't throw them into situations where they're going to get hurt. So you want to expose them. You want them to, to stretch and, and, to, and to, to, to push themselves and maybe fall and, 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 and fail. But you don't want to don't want them to get hurt. So so there's a balance in there. And it was it was deliberate on our part that we were always there to usher them along and to support them and push them along. But at the same time, not letting them get hurt. Do thoughts of them come into your mind when you're up there or is it, do you really try to maintain sort of a set of blinders or have tunnel vision on the tasks that you're focused on for the mission? Well, well, it's very important to compartmentalize that there's sometimes some things you're doing, you focus on that task. You know, you don't let your mind wander off and get distracted by other things. But there are other times in space, for example, when you can uh, pause for a minute and think about your family or whatever. On one spacewalk, uh, they brought my wife into mission control while we were on the spacewalk. Wow. And they let me talk to her very, very briefly. We were doing a retrieval of a satellite, my buddy and I. We were outside on a spacewalk, and we were retrieving a satellite by hand because it malfunctioned, and we could not retrieve it with the robot arm. Mm. And um, it took oh, days of planning and so on. It took about three and a half hours of the spacewalk to actually catch the satellite, but we got it and we brought it in. Oh. And uh, the mission control put Marilyn on the phone. And uh, I, I said to her, hey, honey, I'm sorry I'm late, but I had to stop and get a satellite, but I'll be <laughs> home for supper. So, <laughs> Holy cow. So, <laughs> so you got to kind of keep, you, you compartmentalize, you keep a sense of humor about things and uh, you push forward. But, but you know what? I believe that I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was doing what I was meant to do. Other people probably would not be comfortable up there doing that. And there are other jobs that I would not be comfortable doing. If you put me in certain settings and I'm lost and fumbling and stumbling around, I'd, I'd be lost. So that's what I mean when I say I think people, different people are, are meant to do different types of things in aviation, engineering, and flying, and also is is why I'm I'm here. So, Winston, your your career is very decorated. It covers so many different STEM subjects, and that's something that we know that you're a big proponent of. What do you think it is that drew you to science and engineering as a young man? I was always drawn to science and engineering, even as a youngster growing up in elementary school. But in those days, we didn't have programs in the neighborhood to expose students to what we call STEM nowadays. There was no term called STEM back then. Right. So I went to school originally to major in music and then finished up a degree in engineering and went on to study. But I was interested in science and technology from as early on as I can remember. There was just no way to expose me to it. But I believe... Uh, People have natural interests inside of them. I don't think there's anything we can do to foster something in a person that's not already there. What we can do is expose them, expose our youngsters to as many different disciplines as we can, and then they will gravitate towards the one that they are naturally here for. The problem is a lot of students are gifted in STEM and they just don't know it. Hmm. So our goal as adults is to expose as many people as we can, as many students as we can, to as many disciplines as we can. And some large number of those will gravitate towards STEM. That's, that's my belief. 
So not everybody who becomes interested in in STEM subjects, for example, has the natural chops or has it within them, as, as you kind of put it, to become an astronaut. But there's something about being an astronaut that sort of it's a really good example of like the pinnacle or the apex of of something that a human can achieve. Right. Just it kind of carries with it that that sense of greatness and that that wonder. And, and it works really well as a as a symbol, I think, of something that people of all ages can aspire to. But, you know, at th- the same time, relatively few people have achieved it. But I just wonder for the for the sake of our listeners and for the sake of just, you know, in general, like all of us in general, like, could you give some examples of important STEM careers that you see a lot of young, talented people working towards? Maybe STEM careers that don't immediately seem quite as, say, glorious as becoming an astronaut, but are no less important. Absolutely. In fact, that is what you just said is a very important point. You know, astronauts get a lot of, of, of glory and a lot of credit. You know, people who fly in space sort of get the limelight. But really, space flight, as, as you know, is a team effort. And uh, astronauts may be the people who the cameras focus on. But a lot of the really brilliant people that make space flight important are people who are behind the scenes. Those are the engineers, the technicians, the scientists, the dietitians, all of those people that make the space program work, the people that design the spaceship, the computer programmers, the navigation people, the material scientists, the medical doctors, even the security people. You know, we don't think about it, but we have to have security Mm. at the spaceport. You know, there are a lot of people around the world who would love to infiltrate our space program, you got to have the security. So it truly is a team effort. And some of the most brilliant minds are the people that are behind the scenes. So that being said, there are many, many STEM careers that are challenging and that are rewarding that our young people could pursue. Uh, engineering, of course, is most obvious. But what about being a dietitian? People don't think about it, but the food that we carry in space has to be selected, has to be specially processed, has to be uh, prepared and stored for us and so on. And the dietitians have to examine us and work with us to know how many, what nutrients we'll need on a particular day. Then they go through the trash on the way after we get back to determine who ate what when. They measure you, they weigh in, they determine how many how much of this you had, how many cows, how much calcium, how many carbohydrates, how much fat. I mean, it is a true the science that's that's intimately involved and we need people to do that astronauts take the pictures you know we every picture that comes back from space we took it but we were trained by professional photographers so there's so many highly achieving stem careers that go into making up a space program that that any person in any discipline could get into it artificial intelligence people the robotics experts yeah. yeah, this just yeah. goes on and on and on and on. So my advice when I talk to young people is choose a subject in which you are interested. Choose something that you're passionate about and there's a place for it in the space program. The space program would not work without all of those people. Well, that's wonderful advice to young people. How, how about advice to parents? I know that you speak to a lot of groups of students uh, about what a career in science or engineering could look like. Do you have any, any advice for parents listening on how to encourage a curiosity for STEM in their young kids starting at an early age? The, that, the advice I give the parents is just what you said. You start at an early age and you encourage students, you, you expose them to as many different activities and opportunities as you possibly can and allow them to select what they want to do. Just continuous exposure. Don't push too hard. I think, mm. I think sometimes parents push too hard. And, uh, and you know what happens when you push too hard? Kids push back. I have on occasion run into a parent that uh, the, the, the child may, for example, be interested in the military, but the parent didn't want to go in the military. And they make that known. They're just, they're just adamantly against it. And uh, you know, I, try not, I can't get into people's individual business. But if the opportunity comes up, I try to encourage them not to be afraid. If the, if the student really wants to go into the military, let them know. Yeah. Uh, so parents have to, first of all, not be afraid themselves. And if they are afraid, don't push the fears off on students and then just expose them the best you can and support students in what they're doing. I came from a family and so did my wife, but two parents in the home and uh, education was key and they supported us in the things that we wanted to do. That's important for parents to 
they'll understand that. Yeah. If we could, we'd love to just talk a little bit about the importance of of not just teaching like the subject of science, for example, but the approach to critical thinking and problem solving that tend to go hand in hand with it. Because, you know, we kind of are currently in this sticky climate right now. Like yes. Politically, even eking into just culturally, uh-huh. where it, there seems to be this distrust around the idea of science. It seems like there's something missing along the way between, you know, when we first get into school or educa- being educated by a, a, a larger system and when they're out there in the real world, it seems like there's something missing along the way in terms of emphasis on critical thinking and problem solving. I just wonder what your you know thought on that particular topic is. I agree. And unfortunately, it's missing deliberately. People have agendas mm. and their agendas won't allow them to teach or emphasize critical thinking and dealing with reality because they have an agenda. I think critical thinking has to be taught at home. And it doesn't have to be some formal critical thinking course. You don't have to go to a website and buy a Mm -hmm. book on critical thinking. Just have conversations with students and and deal with reality, deal with what what actually is. But that requires parents to deal with reality and and, and, and you less critical thinking. I have to put my biases aside and deal with what actually is and deal with what I know is, is right. You know, if, even if it makes me uncomfortable, I still have to deal with what is actually true. What is actually happening? What is the truth? And I have those conversations with our, our children and then they learn to observe what is actually happening. Not what somebody told you is happening. What do you see? What do you experience? What is reality? What is right? You know what right and wrong is? So that requires people to let their guard down and to deal with critical thinking themselves, and then inspire their children. Dad's Captain Scott wrote a book about his experiences called Reflections from Earth Orbit, which you can, of course, find on Amazon or you can order through your local independent bookstore. But I'd also recommend that you search for him on YouTube because I think so many experts in science and engineering have trouble explaining complex concepts to young people. You know, they get in the weeds and, and once you've gotten too technical and you've, you've lost a young person, it's hard to bring them back in. Winston Scott shares stories about his NASA experience in such a human way that he makes even the most technical processes easy to understand. So if you've got a son or daughter who is interested in STEM, they will get so much out of watching some interviews with Captain Scott and and the archival footage is, is absolutely fascinating too. So Captain Winston Scott, we are honored to speak with you. Thank you so much for sharing about STEM and your storied career and your fatherhood experience uh, so candidly. Your show intrigued me when we, when you, you sent the email, Modern Dadhood, and I thought about it, but I believe that fatherhood or dadhood is so very, very important. That intrigued me. I thought I would love to come on and, and have some a conversation on your program about, about dadhood and, you know, throw my two cents on the table. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Winston, you spent a lot of time with us and we, we really appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me. I wish you all the best of luck. Dads, here we are at the end. I would invite you to learn more about the podcast at moderndadhood.com. You can search for us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pocket Casts, anywhere you listen. Please subscribe. Please tell your friends to subscribe. Word of mouth helps us out more than you know. So please help us spread the word. In between episode releases... We put out some content on our Facebook page and on our Instagram account. And you should check them out if you don't already. And please drop us a line anytime via the good old email at hey, H-E-Y, at moderndadhood.com. Thank you to Casper Baby Pants and Spencer Albee for our modern dadhood music. To Pete Morse at Red Vault Audio for bringing forth all the right frequencies, making us sound 
super tasty, you can find him at redvaultaudio.com. And last but not least, Adam Jehoshaphat Flaherty. Thank you to the listeners. <laughs> <laughs>